good morning, afternoon, or evening, and welcome to the Bloody Disgusting Network. The following show is just horrifying. Beware. to horror queers we're talking mayo sandwiches we're talking side ponytails and we're talking some truly shitty water polo and i'm joe and i'm trace and we're talking mirror mirror on the wall who is the lydia deetsiest of them all Ooh. <laughs> oh i really need to stop laughing at my own joke when i do that i hate when people do that on podcasts but <laughs> i was I really think proud i think people like it <laughs> Now that that reference, not so much, unfortunately. Oh man, it is it is egregious, and they had to know what they were doing. But um, I'm sorry, getting ahead of myself. Everyone, we are discussing Marina Sargenti's. I'm going to say Sargenti, maybe Sargenti, but uh, Maria Sargenti's 1990 film Mirror Mirror, which man, it, it's a movie. It is a movie. Yes, it's a directed video movie. It is a almost entirely female crew and also mostly female actors Mm -hmm. it's um i don't know like i i kind of liked a lot of this and there's a couple of things i don't care for but overall this was a pleasant surprise so for both of us this is a first time watch right correct yeah okay so yes as listeners know, you know, we kind of go back and forth sometimes when we're watching movies um, and we're like, oh my God, like I'm watching this and blah, blah, blah. And I was messaging you like, I was like, I'm 40 minutes in and I'm really, really liking this. And mm-hmm. and then I saw your three star rating. <laughs> yes. No. It, so it's a movie where I was, I was really into the first half and the last half started to lose me. And then the ending, which I don't hate, it just like, it kind of lost me a bit. So I was like, oh, like... I don't know if it's a budgetary thing. I'm actually, I'm sorry. It's a combination of budgetary issues and screenwriting issues because I do think <laughs> that this movie loses sight of what it should be doing. <laughs> so yeah, it is a three star film, but it's still one that I would heartily recommend because I think there's a lot to like about this movie. Indeed, yeah, and I I kind of like that it's so bold in its homages that it's almost wearing them on its sleeve. Or in the case of Megan's character on her head and in her makeup and in her yes. hair. But yeah, I, I don't mind at all that this is basically Beetlejuice meets Heathers meets Carrie meets, meets the craft. The craft. <laughs> <laughs> like, I kind of like it for all those reasons. Well, this came out before the craft. So, I mean, like, I, we can, you know, eschew that comparison. But again, like, I see what you're saying. And I thought the exact, I think the Carrie comparison is the most apt, um, just in terms of what is happening in this film. I don't think it necessarily pulls off our character switch because, Mm. I mean, we'll get into it in the plot, but it basically like says, oh, um, it's the demon controlling her at at a certain point. I don't really know what that point is, to be honest. (laughs) Well, I almost feel like she gives in to the demon and as a result, then the demon can just act on her behalf. But yeah, I, I wish that there was a stronger moment where we saw Megan... I don't know, like, she never really admits what she's doing is wrong, so it just kind of seems like, oh, she's decided to become homicidal. I think the point where she fucks the mirror is meant to be the turning point. Oh, sure. No, that much is clear. (laughs) There's definitely mirror fucking and licking in this movie, and it's great for it. I think it's one of the standout scenes. Oh, no. It it is... You know, because, like, so many things have been copied and whatnot, especially in horror films, like, you know, but... It's rare for me to see a film that is, I mean, let's say 1990 and before, that makes me go, oh, oh shit, Mm -hmm. like, I've never seen anything like that before. (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) And that one did that. This scene did that. I do think that they had to get a little enterprising with the way that some of this comes about. And I think as a result of some of those maybe financial limitations that force them into some creative boxes like mirror fucking. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it, hey, sometimes that's when the best stuff comes out. And in, in this particular scene, that is what happened. Oh, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> well, Joe, I mean, I'm a little light on production today because there is shockingly little information to find about this movie. 
So yeah, you are correct. So this is a feature directorial debut for music video and commercial director Marina Sargenti. And the cast and crew is 60% female. So it's like, it's, it's majority female, not entirely, but we're, 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 we're getting there. And honestly, I think um, that that's the, one of the few factoids that you can find about this film. You know, mm-hmm. good for it. Dude, this is 1990. No, I know. Like, this I know. is a huge <laughs> achievement. It's actually it one of the reasons that we decided to program this, because it's been a while since we've had a female director that we've covered. But also, I-, I just think this film is really notable for making those kinds of strides, because we see people championing their films now as like, oh my god, this is mostly female directed, and people are falling yep. over themselves to praise it, as we should be, but... To me, this means that Sargenti was a trailblazer in that way. No, I 100% agree with you. And it's not just her, because it's also the writing team. So there's four writers, but the two main writers. Because So we've got Annette Cascone and Gina Cascone. It might be Cascone, again, that might be an Italian thing that I don't really know how to pronounce. And then we have Mar- uh, Sargenti as a co-writer as well, and then Yuri Zeltzer. But the Cascones, uh, so they are a... They're a sister duo, and Mm -hmm. they're really only known for film for this. They did write two of the three sequels this movie has. Oh my gosh. (laughs) They wrote Mirror Mirror 2 Raven Dance and Mirror Mirror 4 Reflections. Apparently Mirror Mirror 3, uh, The Voyeur, is so bad that I guess they came back for the fourth one to be like, we'll write this wrong. (laughs) We will polish this script up because you have tarnished the brand. Pretty much. Um, Which, I mean, I had never honestly heard of this movie until you programmed it. So I was like, all right, well, here we go. Mm -hmm. Uh, Well, you know what? That's kind of a lie. I did hear whenever Oculus came out, I heard a lot of um, rumblings from people that obviously knew this movie from their like video store days that were like, "Um, that's just ripping off Mirror Mirror. And I was like, well, I mean... There's a killer see, mirror also, in both. horror movie X. Like, I can definitely see the comparisons, but at the same time, horror movies lift pretty liberally from each other on the regular. Because how many mo- horror movies the killer mirror are there? Not many, but that's really where the comparisons stop for me. <laughs> like, none of this is really the same, but I digress. <laughs> So yeah, the Cascones, though, they're the authors of a book series called Dead Time Stories. It's middle school grade horror books, originally published under the name A.C. Cascone. They have also written several episodes of the Nickelodeon TV series that is based on those books, and that's like in the last 10 years. Oh, really? Okay, good to see that they're still working. Yeah, I mean, like, they moved from something like this. So their 90s were spent doing this, because I think all four of those, of the Mirror Mirror films did come out before 2000. Okay. Writing the books in the aughts and then doing the show in the 2010s. Well, that's really encouraging because unfortunately, a lot of people associated with this film, this is one of their final credits. Like Sargenti directed an episode of Xena Warrior Princess Mm -hmm. and then star Rainbow Harvest. This is basically one of her last credits. She retired, I think, in 1991. Yeah, she did like two TV movies after this and then quit. But um, P.S. What a name. Oh my god, the name is goddamn delightful, and she is goddamn delightful. I think she's a great actress, and I was really disappointed when I saw that she's not acting anymore. No, I I 100% agree, and uh, uh, to to turn it back around to the film, like, I was disappointed when the the third act doesn't really give her a lot to do. Like, she's the protagonist of this film up until a certain point, when Mm -hmm. it switches, and Nikki, um, Kristen DeTillo's Nikki, um, who's basically our Sue Snell stand-in in this movie then becomes the main character and that's kind of when it loses me but a little bit and not because of nikki because i also think that nikki is kind of a great character Mm -hmm. and maybe that's why it's giving me the craft kind of vibes because it feels like this film doesn't quite know how to play off the animosity between women in a meaningful way I agree. And yeah, I I should say yes. I don't mind that Nikki becomes the main character. I mind that it's at the expense of Megan. Like, why can't we have them both be equal protagonists at the end of this movie? Unfortunately, Mm -hmm. the film just forgets Megan exists. A little bit, yeah. Uh, There's, you know, some fun astral projection stuff that we'll get to. But for the most part, it really is the Nikki show. Yeah, absolutely. Um, So yeah, this film, first of all, it was a Cannes premiere. (laughs) Oh... It premiered May 11th, 1990 at Cannes, before getting released theatrically in the United States on August 31st of that year, opening first in Detroit, before also screening at the Chicago International Film Festival in October of that year. Now, 
I was really confused because I could not find any box office information. I have no idea how much money it made. I don't know what the budget for this movie was. Mm -hmm. Here's the thing. It was one of a flood of lower budget titles released during the home video boom of the 90s. Yeah. They would be given very limited theatrical runs merely as a formality to perhaps secure, let's say, a slightly better shelf space or a late night cable syndication deal. Hmm. It's weird. It's almost like the Netflix model of, oh, we're going to debut our most prestigious films in theaters in a couple of cities, but for the most part, you're streaming at home. That, that kind of is what it is. And there was a big draw on this VHS art box. It was a lenticular case. So the mirror part of the cover was actually like a mirror. Oh, fuck yes. Oh my God. I love that. Well, that's and that was kind of what was so I mean, again, this is something that is it's a, it's a lost art because you can peruse any streaming service and there aren't like these covers. Honestly, the closest thing I've gotten to recapturing like video store of the 90s magic mm -hmm. is Tubi. Only because they have oh. all of these shitty ass horror movies that I remember seeing on like sci fi or on those blockbuster shelves as a kid because it was all these like fucking low budget direct to video movies. Indeed. And we should make it clear we're not shitting on these movies as like necessarily being bad, although I'm sure some of them are. Yeah. It's more the fact that there's a, a level of quality and taste that you would have seen in a video rental store that we're just not really seeing anymore. So it's like Tubi is the one that kind of gathers them up. 100%. We discussed Tubi. I mean, we discussed it. There was a period where we discussed Tubi a lot. And mm -hmm. I, I remember saying, I was like, it's just like, it was a nostalgia factory because there were so many oh, yeah. things on here that I remember seeing the covers for as a kid that I never got to watch because I was too young to watch them. Right. And it makes me want to go back and watch them. One of the covers that always stood out to me was this random horror movie called Bleeders. And it has these like, oh God, humanoid, disgusting alien monsters on the cover. Mm. And it always scared the crap out of me as a kid. And I swear to fuck, I saw it on Tubi. And I was like, I've never seen that. And I'm sure it's absolute horseshit. But I really want to watch it. <laughs> well, right. And where else are you going to see it? And I, I like the fact that you brought it back to movie covers. Because there is something so evocative and nostalgic about this. Like, uh, we both participated in Adrian Torres's project last year. Yes, to be or not to be. Thank you. I was like, I know it was a pun. It was a pun. <laughs> <laughs> but we also elected a film that we wanted to highlight that was available on the service to bring a little bit more attention to it because, you know, to be is one of those things where it's like, it's free and you just have to watch the occasional ad. Mm -hmm. But they've also got movies on there that you don't find anywhere else. And that was where I had the opportunity to watch The Uninvited, which is the cat within a cat movie that I've always wanted to see. Mm -hmm. But like, I don't have $30 for an Arrow or a Vinegar Syndrome Blu-ray. Oh, they have Toby Hooper's Crocodile, which is not a good movie, but something that I watched on Sci-Fi. I want to say at least once a month in the year 2000. <laughs> oh my god, I love that for you. Um, no, but I mean, yeah, it's it's a, it's really a lost art. Like, did, did you have those moments as a kid when you would go peruse the video? Because I know that your horror upbringing came later, but that doesn't mean that you couldn't walk the horror aisle, which is something mm -hmm. I always did as a kid. Oh, absolutely. And I know that people have a lot of nostalgia with their local either mom and pop shop, or maybe you were only allowed to go to a blockbuster for whatever reasons. But I had something called Jumbo Video. Mm -hmm. And it was one of those fantastic video stores that actually had a specialty section just for horror films. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't like, oh, there's regular aisles all over the place. This was like in the back left hand corner. Oh, it's at like the porno section. Kind of. I think there was also a porno section on the right hand side, but <laughs> I never went to that part because I was mm -hmm. too young. I've never been to a video store with a back room. Like, I've never been to one. I mean, they definitely don't exist anymore, but I no. think they were kind of like run out of town after a certain point. No, I know. But like, even as a kid, like, I mean, like, we, we were a blockbuster family, but that's because we didn't, I don't even think we had a mom and pop shop in our neighborhood. Right. Ironically, until like my college years, and obviously that didn't last very long, but I, I just, I've never been to a video store that had a back room for porn. Right. Hmm. Well, anyway, I don't know sorry. that you're missing that much. Anyway, shut the fuck up. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So they had this moat, and then it would take you into kind of a castle turret. And what? Yeah, it was like a 360 
of just horror movies on like four different shelves and they had different music playing and i think sometimes <gasps> they would even have smoke and stuff to make it more atmospheric and i would just always go in there like my family would be looking for regular movies i'm using air quotes and yep. i would just go in there and just do 360 pans the whole fucking time looking at all of these gorgeous mostly 80s covers and the one that always struck me was the mutilator because it looked like the texas chainsaw massacre because it's all just people on hooks. And I was like, what is happening in this movie that these people are on hooks? Have you seen The Mutilator since? I've never actually seen it. Okay. I, I, I'm sorry. I, this is, I, we're not talking about Mirror Mirror right now. But um, I actually blind bought the Blu-ray because I think it's an Arrow Blue. And um, A, the original name was Fall Break. And you can actually watch the cut with like, the Fall Break title card. But oh, fun. it has a title theme song called Fall Break. Like people singing Fall oh, Break. No. <laughs> <laughs> that is fantastic and terrible. It's pretty bad. I don't really like the movie that much, but it's it's um it's dumb fun. Oh no, I mean that's the best part about these, right? Like half the time the films were absolute garbage, but the cover art was a thing of beauty. Well, and so that's the thing, you know, I mean, A, I'm super jealous of this horror section yes, with a moat and whatever. Be. Like I I, mm-hmm. I I would kill to see pictures of this, but I'm sure I'm sure they don't exist. But yeah, I mean for me, you know, we've gone through my origins of horror fam where I wasn't allowed to watch R rated films, so I I would peruse the horror aisle and literally flip every box looking for one that wasn't rated R. So I came mm. to know these covers so intimately. Like again, Bleeders is one that always stuck out. Um The Dentist one and two, the Corbin oh, Burton yes. ones, like th- mm-hmm. those covers were always really striking. But like things that I I, I discovered Tremors this way cuz Tremors was PG-13, I think, and I was yeah. like, "Well, I get to watch that." I got to watch this really shitty movie called King Cobra with Pat Morita about a giant King Cobra. Oh, yes. Mm-hmm. Komodo with Kevin Zeggers. Oh, like that. Yes. <laughs> oh, my God. I love Komodo. <laughs> no, I do too. So terrible. So good. So, I mean, it, 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 again, such fond memories. And while I didn't have the same experience with Mirror Mirror, I think a lot of people did because... Mm. I've noticed more, I mean, I try to do more research and you know, like Googling, oh, like, are there think pieces about this film? Spoiler alert, there aren't really. But when I posted, I was watching, I saw people that were like, oh my God, this is one of those like mainstay video rentals for me as a kid. Yeah, I could imagine it got a lot of play on television when that started to become like a syndicated thing, because this is perfect. Like you're not going to scare too many people. Like, I can imagine girls renting this for slumber parties and that kind of stuff. Like, yeah, I'm hesitant to even call it gateway because some of the stuff in here is actually pretty horrifying. Like Mm -hmm. Charlene getting mutilated in the steam is actually quite upsetting. But this also feels sort of tame in a lot of ways. Well, and, you know, the whole time I was watching, I was like, this feels like a TV movie to me. Yeah. This doesn't feel like a theatrical release. Um, I mean, I watched it on Amazon because it's streaming on Prime, although I think it's also on Shutter, so I don't, I don't know if the quality is better. Mm. But the quality looks like a VHS transfer. <laughs> like, it doesn't yeah. look good. <laughs> yeah. I guess, too, when I was watching it, I was kind of judging it on those terms. Like, I wasn't scrutinizing this film with the same scrutiny that I would give to something that was a more mainstream theatrical release. And maybe that's unfair, but that's just kind of how my brain works. Uh. I mean, I think we'll get into it. I did manage to find one pretty decent reading from Kate Hagen, who I follow on Twitter, and she's delightful and lovely. She talks about erotic horror, or sorry, she talks about erotic thrillers quite often. So uh, she's one of my favorites for that. But yeah, I found a piece that she did on like 31 Days of Feminist Horror, and she really talked this film up as one of those, I was about to say seminal. What's what's the Ovester term for (laughs) seminal? (laughs) Ominal? Yeah, I guess. Oven, ovaminal. Ovaminal? Yeah. <laughs> she talked about it as an ovaminal, uh, a horror film for girls. And I got a couple of good uh, choice pieces out of her article. But yeah, it it feels like this is one where I think when this episode drops, people will be like, oh, right, I remember watching that. But it's probably not a mainstay for a lot of folks. Yeah, for sure. Well, this movie did get reviewed when it came out. Like, I mean, so it's not on Rotten Tomatoes, but Entertainment Weekly did give this a B minus um, when it was released. Okay. On Rotten Tomatoes, it is one of the few films without a tomato meter score because there are only two reviews for it. Both uh, more, I'm going to say more contemporary. They're both posted like after the year 2000. Right. But one is good, one is bad. <laughs> okay. Well, we'll see if we can edge that up with this. Yeah. And we've got a letterboxed score of 5.8 out of 10. So. You know, it's pretty, I think that's pretty on par, because again, like, for me, that's basically a three out of five. Right. Yeah, I think you said three out of five. I'm somewhere between a three and a three and a half. I think that's fair. I mean, again, we'll, we'll, 
We'll see if either one of our minds change as we discuss this, which uh, we can start now. All right. So we open with some old timey music in the late 1930s. Uh, 50s. No, her diary says 1939. It does say 1939, but the music is the 50s. Is it? Yes. I, okay, so let's not cut this out because I, I'm curious because uh, this is stupid. The Wikipedia plot does say the 50s, but okay. but the music to me cues me to the 50s. But you are correct in that it does say the 1939 in her journal. So I don't know. I don't know if that's an... Okay, maybe I'm wrong or maybe the movie is confused. <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, some of the details do get a little lost in translation in this script, so mm-hmm. I'm not surprised that we're already struggling with this. But okay, so yep. we open in the far a past, decade. we'll say. <laughs> a decade. There was a decade in time, that's where we open. <laughs> Most important to know, we are introduced to Mary Weatherworth, and she is played by Tracy Lee Gold. And basically, our introduction is a cold open. We see her stabbing her twin sister, Elizabeth, who is played by Michelle Gold, mm-hmm. to death in some kind of... Uh... Well, so we don't really know what it is yet, right? Like, we just know that she's killing her. We know the... Mi- oh, obviously, we're watching a movie called Mirror Mirror. So we know, <laughs> we know the mirror is, like, something to do with it. <laughs> but there's this interesting moment where it seems like something is trying to come through the mirror, and then it closes again. And I'm not gonna lie, considering how female-driven this film is, I was a like... A vagina hole? Is that a vagina? Yes! I wrote, the mirror gets a vagina hole and then closes after the woman dies. <laughs> mm-hmm. Okay, I'm glad to see we're on the same page with We this. are. Two men who like men noticing vagina holes. That's what this podcast is all about. Hell, that's the alternative title of this podcast. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so then we get some credits, and now we're up to the present day, which is presumably 1989, 1990. Sure. So, we are introduced to antique shop owner Emmeline, who is played by the wonderful Yvonne DiCarlo. So, most people will know her as Lily Munster from The Munsters. That's great. I actually don't really know her from much else. No, me neither. Like, you had it on the cheat sheet, and then when I put her into the search, the Google search, it was like, oh yeah, okay, I recognize her, but she looks so different to me out of makeup. Yes. She's had a very, I mean, oh, I'm sorry, she's also in The Ten Commandments, that's one thing I, I mean, I've seen that movie, so like, I know I've seen her in it, but like, I couldn't tell you who she is in that movie. <laughs> oh, I see. Okay, I have no relationship to that movie. Uh, Catholics, baby. I mean, good on you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i've seen some people compare her role to poltergeist yes so of zelda rubenstein and mm-hmm. apparently she was supposed to have a role in this movie but she had to back out for undisclosed reasons now i have to assume this was the role <laughs> oh right like there's no other role this could have been no, I I 100% think so. And I 100% think that if she backed out for any other reasons, then, oh, I've already played this role in a bigger franchise. No, thank you. I think this would have come out like, oh, God, I don't, I'm not going to look it up, but like around the time of Poltergeist 3. And I wonder if just like with everything with um, Heather O'Rourke dying and like mm. the horrible shit that movie went through, if like, yeah. maybe she was like, I'm taking a break. Like, <laughs> I'm not going to do this shit. I'm done playing mystic spiritualist. Thank you. Yeah, um, but yeah, so th- this character, Emmeline, I mean, Avanda Carlo must have been on set for three days because she is constantly by herself yes. delivering exposition about this mirror. Mm-hmm, which I love because it's only for our benefit. Yeah, no, she's re- and she's reading out loud to herself, and it's like, why are you reading? <laughs> like, why are you doing this? <laughs> I mean, my God, give her a cat or something that she can at least play off of. It also takes her several days to make it through this journal. Like, I'm sorry. Like, (laughs) I don't think there's, like, that much material that would require you to spend days trying to figure out what's going on with this mirror. I'm sorry. I'm just imagining the salacious sex life of Mary Weatherworth being like, oh, this is so juicy (laughs) reading. Also, Weatherworth, man. Like, what the fuck? I know. And they keep saying it. Oh, the Weatherworth house. I just thought that does not roll off the tongue as someone who's tried to say it repeatedly on this podcast can attest to. I want to say Weatherford, which I think is what you mistakenly said, like initially, initially almost said before you corrected yourself or like Butterworth. <laughs> I, I mean, Butterworth is the one that comes to mind most distinctively, but yeah. uh, just call her Mary Weather or yeah. Mary yeah. Worth. There, there, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but it lacks, like, the gravitas of something like Weatherworth, you know? This is true. It doesn't have that antique vibe that we're looking for. Mm-hmm. 
So all this to say, Emmeline is there to clean up the old Weatherworth house because it has been purchased by a widowed woman named Susan Gordon, who is played by Karen Black, mm-hmm. and also her teenage daughter, Megan, who is played, as we mentioned, by Rainbow Harvest. And it's a very fun dynamic, at least at the beginning. Um, wait, I'm sorry, really quick before we move on to these people, uh, I just want to say that I, I did make a note. <laughs> so when Emmeline finds the journal, so she finds the journal, which is the diary from 1939. Mm-hmm. She also finds a book titled The Black Arts. And then she yes. just goes, hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Like, it's like, this is a curious thing to find in this house. Not like, what the fuck is this? <laughs> well, not even like, oh, right. There was a brutal murder that happened in this house. This explains a lot. Well, and then she finds another book that's like scientific occultism. And it's like, lady, you mm-hmm. hit the jackpot. You've solved the crime. <laughs> Very much so, and she doesn't seem to care, she's not all that bothered by it, but she's also like, I'm gonna take these home for some late night bedtime reading. I honestly thought that she was gonna be the one to get the power of the mirror, like, she was gonna read the journals and be like, I can do this too. Like, that's what I thought we were going to. (laughs) I didn't know what was happening, I didn't know if this was our main character, and then... To find out, oh, no, we're actually just doing this because other characters are going to come in was a little confusing initially. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay, so we are introduced to Susan and Megan. And Susan uh, is later described by Megan as very Beverly Hills, which I thought was a perfect description of how Karen Black is playing this chipper and bright motherfucking woman. So... Honestly, this is a character that, I mean, she's fun to watch, but she's very, it's very much like, your husband died four months ago. Mm-hmm. Why? Again, it, it, the just the write-off is, oh, she's just very L.A. She's very L.A., but you can also tell that she's very sad. Like, she is trying so fucking hard to be happy, and she's yes. not really doing a great job of it. And I will say that I actually really enjoy her arc in this film. Mm-hmm. To the point where when, spoiler alert, everyone, when she <laughs> dies at the end of the film... I was genuinely upset. Oh, yeah. No, I don't. I feel like very few of these deaths are satisfying in the way that we go, oh, yeah, fuck that character. It's very much like, oh, this is just getting more and more sad. Yeah. I mean, even with the head bitch who, well, okay, sorry, we'll talk about it when we get there. (laughs) (laughs) I have thoughts about Charlene. Yeah. Okay. And of course, Megan is basically doing Lydia cosplay from Beetlejuice. It's apparent from the get go, she will eventually get a hat. (laughs) The hat that, is magnificent. It is magnificent, but it is straight up out of Beetlejuice. I was mm-hmm. like, okay, I mean, it's shameless, it's egregious, but I'm like, you know what, whatever, fuck it. Like, <laughs> this is this is like a low-budget movie from 1990 that came out two years after Beetlejuice, so here we go. Oh, I, I totally loved it. I don't fault the movie for it at all. Right. And in part, I think it's because Rainbow Harvest looks so fucking much like Winona Ryder. Like, there were times yes. where I thought, is this Winona Ryder just doing cosplay? Honestly, the only time where I was taken out of that illusion, because she has on the side of her head, like, a blonde. Like, yes. yeah. I mean, I guess they're roots. I don't Or maybe, like, the dye didn't get that far down her head. I don't know oh, what it bitch, is. bitch, no, that's a punk aesthetic. She's got, like, half and half. There you go. Okay. Um, that's the only thing that took me out of it, because all I was missing was a red bridal dress. Right. I did see somebody else describe this as it's basically Lydia meets Boy George. And I thought, oh, that's also apt. <laughs> that's very apt, yeah. <laughs> uh so megan is not excited to be moving into this new place but she does like the mirror in her room Mm -hmm. immediately attracted to it Mm -hmm. in a very physical way that we will soon find out i mean if you find a mirror that turns you on stroke it lick it fuck it uh what is there's a word for something for people that are like sexually attracted to inanimate objects Oh, God, I'm not going to be able to remember, but apparently there was that great Jumbo movie that came out last year. Oh, yeah, 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 I know, you're right, um, which you've seen and I haven't, but uh, yeah, I I think it's also in one of those, um, like, my, my... Oh, God, like my secret addiction or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like that thing. Oh, dear. Yeah. Um, that's a dark path. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so Megan heads off to school and this is a very clean cut preppy high school, which basically means she's the only person wearing black. Um, yes, I actually like that. Like the difference between her, her outfit and everything else, even the production design is mm-hmm. kind of great this entire time. Oh, yeah. And we're introduced to this subplot involving the class president. Mm-hmm. Rinks. I was very invested in this subplot, actually. 
Oh my god, when they said that the election had already ended and we didn't get something bigger, yes! I was disappointed. <laughs> I was so mad. I was like, I wanted to see this. But I guess they're like, well, you don't want to see Charlene win. No. Okay. This is true. Yeah, so this is a race between ambitious political student Nikki Chandler, played by Kristen Datillo, and she has a dim bald boyfriend named Ron, who is played by Ricky Paul Golden. And Ron is kind of like the comedic MVP of this movie because he's a full blown idiot. So he's actually a horror quiz veteran, Joe. Do you know where we've talked about him before? So I knew I recognized him, but I couldn't place him. He is the guy in the blob who essentially tries to date rape yes. that girl before her body like sucks him in. Okay, yes. Yes. <laughs> I think I found him cute in the blob too. Yeah, no, I, I mean he's cute here, he's cute there. He's less of a shithead here. Um well kind of, honestly. Kind of. Yeah, like <sighs> He's not great, we'll put it that way. Yeah, for being Nikki's boyfriend, which I honestly didn't realize they were dating until about the midway point of the film. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but okay. Yeah, he's just, he's just like, I didn't like that he was also mean to Megan. Like, I kind of wish it was like, like a mean girl situation, right? Where it's like, oh, we have mm. the Janice and the Damien. No, here it's just Janice and another douchebag. Right, yeah. I mean, I don't think he's as mean as other people, but no. well, I think he even says at one point, you know, why are you making a pet project of this girl? Like he, he feels like Megan is coming between them and he doesn't like it. There is a time later, though, where he flat out tells her, like, oh, yeah, can you make the mirror make you normal? And it's like, dude. Yeah, no. That's go shitty. away. Yeah. Extra shitty. Yeah. So Nikki's political adversary is the mean girl of the school, and that is Charlene Kane, and she is played by Charlie Spraulding. Nice knockers. Um, yeah, I was not expecting to get a Tata scene in this movie, but uh, DTV, maybe? Well, it's like, because all of her political ads emphasize her tits, um, and that's the <laughs> line we get from Ron. It's like, I mean, like, the only thing she has that you don't or whatever is, like, nice knockers. <laughs> yeah, and then Nikki's like, stop looking at her tits. What is yeah. wrong with you? <laughs> Ah, uh, sadly, Megan makes a bad first impression when she goes into Mr. Anderson, who is played by Stephen Tobolowski's class. Who will repeat this role in 2003's Freaky Friday. Mm -hmm. Oh, I mean, like, I had to look up the character's name because I don't know that they really ever say it. But as mm. soon as he showed up, I was like, oh, it's Tobo. He's yeah. playing Tobo because he only ever plays Tobo. 100%. The only time I have seen him not play this type of role is in One Day at a Time, the Netflix slash pop series. Oh, right. Yes. Okay. He plays uh, the, the boss, the main character, but he gets in a relationship with Rita Moreno. Oh, nice. Okay. Well, that mm -hmm. sounds like a nice stretch for him. Literally, when when he showed up, I was like, oh, I fucking hate this guy. <laughs> <laughs> and then he's like, oh, he's not playing a total shithead. Okay. Yeah, because he often plays this sarcastic sardonic kind of jerky authority figure someone who clearly was bullied a lot as a child who was a bully as an adult eh, okay i mean fits with the theme of this movie oh yeah for sure <laughs> yeah so megan trips almost immediately i do like the use of slow-mo in this film in particularly important moments to megan so she has a slow-mo moment where she walks in and everybody's just staring at her and whispering and then it trips her up literally and she runs out of class but it endears her to nikki who comes and brings her her bags and they start their friendship Okay, so I was getting major, obviously we've said Carrie, but like going back to one of our very first episodes on the Rage Carrie 2, mm. I felt like as someone who was pretty like meticulously, meticulously, oh my, my words are off today, Um, who was pretty <laughs> ridiculously bullied right. a lot in middle school, like I think this is why I enjoyed the first half of this movie so much is because I loved seeing this friendship develop between oh the two. Oh my god, yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Their chemistry is great and it's just, <laughs> again, it's like, it's like, oh, we have this girl who She's the outcast, and these people are mean to her just because she wears black. Yes. Uh, they were so charismatic and charming that I just wanted to see more of them together. Absolutely. And even though, like, the film is actually giving us a lot of that in the first half, mm -hmm. it makes you realize, once again, how infrequently we get good female friendships, particularly in horror films. So then this comes along, and you think, oh, fuck, yes, give me more of this. I actually like it. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Fair yeah. point. Okay, so we need to cut back to the antique shop so that we can touch base with Emmeline. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, she's just reading Mary's diary, and we're learning about the fact that there's evil, and she's doing this light reading, and then she catches up with real estate agent Mrs. Perlili, who is played by Anne Hurd. Perfili. Perhealy? 
fee. Like, it's an F. Like instead of a Lily, it's a Feely. Like Mr. McFeely. God damn it. I had that no, right then, and it's no. wrong on IMDb. Trust me, I made the same mistake when I was re- making writing my notes. So I was right there with you. <laughs> All right. So she connects with real estate agent Miss Perfeely, and uh Who's pregnant for no reason. For no reason, and barely plays a part in this movie, but she does turn up a couple times. Mm -hmm. And this is where we learn that the mirror that was supposed to be delivered to the antique shop is still in Gordon House. Yep, and she's just kind of like, huh, Hmm. that's interesting. I'll come back to that later. Yeah, I'm gonna gonna take a day, and I'm gonna continue reading these books. (laughs) Mm -hmm. I'm just such a slow reader. (laughs) <laughs> all right so megan comes home from school and this is where we learn that one of the dogs so susan has two new dogs i got the impression they're kind of like therapy dogs for her or something to fill the void they are because her therapist or i'm sorry her psychiatrist told her to get the dogs told sorry told her to move mm-hmm. <laughs> and told her to get two dogs <laughs> yes and is like telling her to make friends and like start her life again it's like I don't know, man, this all seems really fast. Well, I mean, I'm not a therapist, admittedly, but I don't think therapists are supposed to tell you what to do. I think Mm -hmm. they're supposed to guide you, but not say, yeah, you should totally, like, totally uproot your life and move away. Yeah. It's kind of fun, too, that it's just a disembodied voice on the phone, so we don't ever meet this person, but... I'm going to say that they're the real villain of this movie. There is a phone call that happens between Karen Black and the psychiatrist. And she's like going on about how uh, she can't sleep, blah, blah, blah. And she's mm-hmm. like, and I'm hot. And I'm like, what Menopausal. is your psychiatrist going to do <laughs> about how hot you are? She wants pills. She wants an ice bath. She wants reassurances that she's still sexy because she's going through menopause. And the therapist asks how the dogs are doing. And she's like, I don't know. I've only had them for two weeks. <laughs> It's okay. <laughs> bananas. Yeah. So one of these dogs is already dead, though, because, of course, yeah. it went into the room and Ooh, yeah. off-screen violence. Content warning for two dead dogs. We see the corpse of the first one, but thankfully not the second one. Yeah. I will say I may have given a chuckle at the fact that Susan is so out of touch that she doesn't see anything wrong with prominently displaying the dead dog's body on the kitchen counter. No, I, I agree with you. I'm blaming it on the grief because th- I think she's just like, I don't know what to fucking do. But, oh, 100%. Yeah. Uh, it's a hilarious visual and mm-hmm. Megan's reaction to it is appropriate. <laughs> yes. Megan is like, what the fuck is this? Why is this up here? <laughs> <laughs> So then that night, Megan has a nightmare about the decomposing body of her dead father attacking her. And like, all of this stuff is so good. Yeah, I really like this too. Mm -hmm. And the makeup on this guy, like, Mm -hmm. he basically looks like a melted wax figure. And it's awesome. It's really good. Yeah. Simple, though. It's simple, but effective. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. So the next morning at school, Megan runs into Charlene's hot and seemingly kind boyfriend, Jeff. And the problem is, is that Jeff, who is played by Tom Bresnahan, he looks quite similar to Ron. To Ron? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like generic white boy syndrome in this movie. <laughs> no, I thought the same thing. I also, for some reason, wrote him down as Ted initially in my notes. and then I, I also had Ted. Okay. Oh my god. Okay, no, I, I think they say Ted. I think they, I think say, they say Ted, Ted. Yeah. at his first thing, at his first appearance, but then it's Jeff for the rest of the movie. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> Folks, as we mentioned, there are some wonky things happening with this movie. Having just edited our episode on The Forsaken, where sometimes we're like, uh, I don't remember what happened, or in The Skulls, where we're like, we stopped paying attention to this movie. This is not one of those cases. We both meticulously mm-hmm. watched this movie. <laughs> Yeah, I'm blaming the movie in this part. Uh, Yeah, this is the movie's fault. (laughs) So Megan is introduced to Jeff Ted, and she finds him quite hot, which is understandable because Jeff Ted is quite hot. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, And then she proceeds on. So she and Nikki have kind of a great day where they're getting in trouble in drama class, and then they're hanging out in the art room. This scene was good, too. (laughs) I loved this drama class scene. (laughs) I just love that they're giggling like little shits and everybody's, hey, we're trying to perform here. Can you shut the fuck up out there? I think it's Charlene, right? Oh, is it Charlene on the stage? I that think so. Sense. I mean, I, guess. Okay. <laughs> I think so. I think it's Charlene. And then she yells at the teacher. The teacher's been sleeping the whole time. And I was mm-hmm. like, this is great. Like, this is yeah. so awesome. <laughs> yeah. And then we see that Nikki is actually really great at making objects out of clay. She's done an entire bust of Ron's head. And then she makes fun of how stupid he is. 
the, okay, the clay thing I thought was going to play a part in some Me kind of too. magical. Yes. Okay. Don't introduce <laughs> clay and then not do something with it. I don't know. <laughs> this isn't ghost. Like, you can't just, like, have a pottery scene and make it, like, iconic. You need to do something with this clay. Yeah, because, folks, we are not talking about a small sculpture. This thing is larger than his actual head. And yes. it's actually really impressive. Yeah, it's good. <laughs> it will never come back again. I mean, well, it does later, and it's been messed up, but, like, it doesn't do anything. Like, no. It doesn't come alive and kill somebody. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> uh, okay, but through all of that, we've been learning a little bit more about Weatherworth and uh, the historical legacy of the house. Mm-hmm. All right. So, at home, because of the dead dog, Susan has invited Mr. Bill Veazey, played by William Sanderson, to dinner. Okay. The whole time, because this is before I made my little notes, I was like, who the fuck is this actor? He looks so familiar. Mm-hmm. Um, Sheriff Dearborn from True Blood. <laughs> yeah. He's got such a meek, mousy face. He's one of those character actors where he shows up and you just think, oh, okay, I know who you are immediately. Uh, unfortunately, again, though, like his inclusion kind of comes to nothing. Yeah, it's a little bit surprising to the extent that I almost wonder if there was a subplot or something that got dropped because it really does feel like they're building up to something with him and Susan. And yes, obviously we get the sex scene later on, but that's it for him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Yeah, he just leaves the movie at a certain point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a bit of that in the back half. Mm -hmm. So we have this awkward dinner. Megan (laughs) is not happy that he is there, but she's not being a bitch or a brat about it. She's just not really engaging with anything. She's just quiet. Yeah, she's just quiet. And then this is where the flies begin to arrive. (laughs) So it's it's very Amityville horror. Mm Mm-hmm. But yeah, so we have like a nest of flies building on the corner of the mirror. Oh, also I should point out, I actually love the way that um, the mirror is shot. It's frequently shot from like below to where mm-hmm. it has this kind of hulking presence. So there's a menace to this mirror that I really like from the get-go. Oh, yes. And then later on, we'll actually see scenes that are almost shot like from the mirror's point of view. And mm-hmm. those are also great. Yeah, they're really good. Yeah, it's like a blue tint, but it's kind of out of focus. Or maybe that was just the VHS transfer. I don't know. Good question. <laughs> <laughs> but but yeah, and so then we just get this really like lengthy scene of Sheriff Dearborn like swatting flies away from his food. Mm-hmm. And no one's saying anything. <laughs> no one's saying anything. And then at one point he's just like, all right, I can't do this anymore. So he leaves, but he makes a reference to flashbacks. And I couldn't yeah. help but wonder, is that a reference to like Vietnam? So he does say Vietnam. Oh, does he? Okay, I missed that yes. part. He's having PTSD flashbacks because he was in Vietnam. Mm-hmm. I like it because it's like, okay, he's not sitting here like, oh, this is a dirty ass house with flies. He's mm-hmm. literally like blaming himself for it. Yeah. But it's also kind of like, okay, but like, why? Like, why, why is this important for us to know? Yeah, it's a bit of an odd character beat. Like, I like that for him because it does give him Mm -hmm. just something more that we didn't really know that we needed from him. I took it to be that we're already associating this house with death. Uh, okay. No, I get that. That makes sense. I mean, maybe it'd be too cruel, but, like, if he he was, A, had a death scene that Mm -hmm. involved something with, like, a Vietnam flashback or he thought he was having a flashback, but it was actually something coming to kill him. Like, you know, that would make sense to me. Right, because even, you know, Megan never discovers that he has been sleeping with her mom, and that would totally make sense, right? Like, she discovers this, she blames him because dad isn't there anymore. Well, like, dad is dead, but, you know, mom is moving too fast, and she's sleeping with you, and then, yeah, we get something Vietnam-related. Yeah, I mean, yeah, maybe that's in poor taste, I don't know, but... It, just, it would make the inclusion of this make more sense. Mm-hmm. I think really after this, we just get the kind of sex scene between him and the mom, and there's nothing else with him after that. I think so, yeah. Yeah. Okay, but already what we're establishing is that there is a bit of a division between mother and daughter because Megan does not approve of these actions either. So in gym class the next day, we get further clarity that Megan is being ostracized by everyone except Nikki when she is chosen last for some kind of pool team matchup. I wrote in my notes, in all caps, why do they make kids pick each other in turns? Like, oh, it's so bad. <laughs> we see it on Drag Race because they're obviously trying to start drama, like whatever. Mm-hmm. But I never understood why in, like, in school... Why yeah. do you want to instantly, like, split your kids up and make someone feel left out like that? Because I can tell you mm-hmm. right now, being picked last, while it's a stereotype um, of, like, you know, of a trope of films like this, it doesn't feel good. It really sucks. 
Yeah, and it really does happen because someone literally has to be chosen last. And the reality is, is that it's going to be the person who isn't popular to the people who are picking the teams. And this scene is even more egregious because not only is she put on Charlene's team, but then they're like, can she not just go on the other team? We'll take one less player. It's fine. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It's so bizarre, too, because of course she's going to be picked last. She's literally the new girl. It would make more sense for this. I mean, this gym teacher is a huge bitch. So... I'm not surprised. But at the same time, you would think, oh, there's the new girl. Let's make sure she gets chosen first to make her feel welcome. That would make more sense. I mean, have you you ever, again, I can't think of a specific instance, but I know in my mind that I've been picked last for something like this. Have you ever had an experience like this? Oh, for sure. Yeah, because I I played a bunch of sports and it's more casual, right? Like it's more pickup kind of stuff, but it's like, oh, okay, who's going to get picked last? And I've... I was never good at those kinds of sports, so I wasn't picked first. Oh, okay. I, was, I guess I just would think that you would be. Maybe that's why you got into sports later is because you're trying to, like, redo, like, <laughs> your childhood. Entirely possible. I mean, I played soccer as a kid, but that's mm-hmm. not a sport where you get picked. So it was like you just end up on a team. What sports were you forced to play as a kid? So I played baseball, and that mm-hmm. was bad. <laughs> Oh, I also got beamed, so that was not good. I had like I don't want to say PTSD because that's overselling beamed? it, but I yeah, like if you get hit by the ball. Oh, like int- purposefully? Well, someone was pitching and the oh. ball hit me. Oh, I guess I'm thinking like when you swing the bat, it like it might be like a girly swing, and so people like sorry, not for you specifically, <laughs> but like in general for us queer folk, because that was definitely my issue when I played baseball. <laughs> Didn't have a good swing. Didn't have a good swing. Um, yeah, I did baseball. I did basketball once, and Ooh. I did soccer. I hated soccer, though, because um, I hated the socks. Uh, okay. Not a fan of the thigh highs, huh? Yeah, it's the thigh highs, and you have to wear, like, the shin guards. And yeah. I will say that peeling those things off is orgasmic. <laughs> a wet brook. Oh, it's so gross. I, I, I really, really hated sports. I have a PTSD of my parents yelling, Hustle! Hustle! <laughs> like, oh, as you're no. running down the field. Ugh, I hate that. Yeah, and just in case anyone is working in mental health and they want to challenge us, we recognize that we're saying PTSD very liberally and very flippantly. It's more just, it can be upsetting to remember not great memories from the past. Uh, Well, again, don't want to say trauma. It's not really trauma because it's not like, well, it's just bad memories. It's, yeah, bad memories of this shit. But I did interrupt Mm. you. So if you wanted to continue your story, (laughs) you can continue your story. No, no. I mean, we'll we'll get back to the movie because really this is about Megan and how she feels. Um, well, except we're about to cut back to the movie that Emma Lynn's in. <laughs> yes, this is true. Some of these early scenes do suffer from some weird editing decisions because it's almost like, oh, right, we got to get Emma Lynn in here somewhere. So there is uh, this bit about how we learned that black cloth can be used to block the demon's power. Yes, which... Okay. Okay. <laughs> uh, I-, I will accept this fact. Um, why... She doesn't just put the thing on the mirror later. Um, I don't know. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, I guess guess she gets stabbed, but whatever. She was seduced by its power, Trace. She was going to stroke it. It just says, mirrors are a gateway to the other side, allowing demons to enter our world. The demons will seduce people into using its power and then fall prey to the demon's evil bidding. Mm -hmm. And a black cloth was used to void the creature's power, which I hope y'all aren't expecting to see much of a creature in this movie. Yeah, we we get a couple glimpses and that's about it. And questions will arise later. Indeed, yeah. <laughs> All right, so we cut back to what's happening at school. And we've got Nikki and Charlene butting heads in the cafeteria about their respective electoral campaigns. It's all fun stuff. Yeah. And then we shift into slow motion as Megan and Nikki and Ron walk to their seats. And Megan, again, hears people laughing at her. And this is where, at home, the mirror begins to bleed. And at school, Mm. Charlene starts to get a really fucking epic nosebleed. It's rivaled only by the one in Drag Me to Hell, but it is great. I also think the visual of the blood pouring down this mirror is kind of awesome. 
Mm-hmm. And then, of course, we're we're using some pretty obvious reversal, like we're just running the film backwards. But it is also great when Susan then approaches the door because the dog is barking at the mirror, and mm-hmm. we just see the blood retracting back up. And yep. yes, I'm going to make the obvious final destination water back into the toilet reference. Well, but that's the thing that the the, the mirror constantly covers up its tracks, like it makes oh, yeah. bodies just disappear. <laughs> I fucking love it. It's kind of great. Like, the the powers of this mirror are basically everything. Oh, yeah. If you can imagine it, this mirror can do it. Mm -hmm. And normally I'd be like, I'd like these powers defined a little bit more. I don't care here. I don't care. No, give me sentient mirror who can do fucking everything. I'm really happy with it. (laughs) Yeah, this mirror sprouts some legs and arms. Well, it does kind of sprout arms at one point. This is true have it walk around the house i am there for it <laughs> oh my god a walking mirror that's <laughs> terrifying so good <laughs> okay so we hop over to nikki's house where we're just kind of hanging out and this is where megan starts to wonder if she and or witchcraft is responsible for charlene's nosebleed this is when ron pieces out he is not interested in the conversation so he just yeah. leaves I said the line earlier, but yeah, he, because basically Nikki and Ron still don't believe her about Mm -hmm. the mirror. And Megan is pretty much like, no, I'm pretty sure I made that happen. And his line to her is, yeah, why don't you try to make something happen right now? Like, make yourself a normal person. And I'm just so mean. Yeah, Dick, you don't have to do that. I mean, there's a certain amount of questioning that organically happens when you're in high school because you're just trying to figure shit out anyway. But like, she's clearly upset about it. You don't need to be a dick. Yeah, but again, he he never he never thought she was okay to begin with. Like, it's not like no. he's turning on her. He's just like always thinks she's weird. Yeah, he he is only talking to her because Nikki is talking to her. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. The next day at school, Charlene and her lackey Kim, who is played by Dorit Sar, they have decided that the next level of intimidation is that they're going to dress up in black, just like Megan. So, did you catch the Carrie reference here? No, I did not. So in in the car when they pull up, first uh, Jeff Ted is <laughs> like, uh, "Y'all, this is really mean." Blah blah blah. And Charlene is doing her whole. It's just a joke, which is what bullies oh, love yes. to do. Mm-hmm. But she goes, "It's not like we're gonna coat her in pig's blood or anything." Oh my god, really? Yeah, nice. <laughs> okay. So the movie very much knows what it's doing. <laughs> oh yes, I get the sense that this film knows exactly what it is referencing, mm-hmm. <laughs> and it does play like that. It, well, okay, sorry, the, well, comparisons don't need to be made because we've already made them. Right. Okay. So Megan comes in and she just kind of ignores this, but she's obviously, you know, a little upset by it. Yeah, but I didn't think, honestly, like in terms of pranks, I was kind of like, oh, that's it? Okay, like if someone wants to dress up like me, by all means, <laughs> like do it. Yeah, it, it's just a little bit mean and it does get a line out of Tobo because he says, yeah. oh, I hope this isn't the start of something. Yeah, that, mm. I feel like teachers, I mean, again, maybe I'm totally wrong, but I feel like teachers can't really get away with shit like that nowadays. No. I never had a teacher like this. I never had a teacher that like single, single anyone out really, to my knowledge, for things like that. Um, I did. I had one who was admittedly a little close to retirement age, but I vividly remember a faculty member in in high school. We had a, a faculty member who told us that we wouldn't amount to anything except working in fast food. Oh, I had that in college. I had a professor tell us that um, we can all go sign up for the war and get killed because we didn't do our reading the night before. Jesus. <laughs> but that's college. Okay. Like, we're adults by that point. I mean, admittedly, but that also seems a little bit like, well, if you want to fail, it's your decision. You're paying for it. Pretty much, yeah. Anyway, so Tobo decides to take his intimidation to the next level because he checks her test and he's unhappy. So he's like, it's some kind of line about like, oh, your your problem is that you don't have any solution. Yeah. So, so did, was she not doing the test? I thought that she had just finished it, but maybe she just hadn't completed it at all. Yeah, I don't know. I thought maybe she just wasn't doing it, but I, yeah, the film doesn't really it's not clear. tell us. <laughs> no. All this to say, it doesn't make her happy because he then begins to choke. We quickly learn that he is asthmatic, and then he collapses on his desk and gets wheeled away. And wheeled out of the movie. Mm-hmm. Yes, never to be seen again. Goodbye. Mm-hmm. Thank you, Tobo. <laughs> That's a wrap on Tobo. Yep. 
So at home, Susan is making her best effort to get a little zhuzhed up. She's got a lime green mini skirt. She's looking hot. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, I do also like the fact that Susan wears different wigs throughout the film because yes, it's just fun. Again, Karen Black's face is fairly distinct, but it's this mm-hmm. long haired wig where I was like, okay, this looks like Karen Black. Yes. What she's introduced in, I was very much like, oh, this this is a different look for her. But that's supposed to be her real hair, right? Or is that still a wig? I kind of thought that they were all wigs. Maybe that's true. You may, you may be right. You might be right. Yeah, because when she's introduced, and I'm like already losing names, so you're going to have to help me. She mm-hmm. looks like Adam's Family Values. Debbie Jelinski. Oh, my yeah. God. I thought the same fucking thing. Like, even <laughs> <Okay>. the way... <laughs> <laughs> Even the way she like behaves, her her, her mannerisms, like it's yes. very Joe Cusack and Adam's Family Values. <laughs> yes, because I I actually thought, oh maybe she's going to be the villain and she's going to be telling Megan, no, you can't do mm-hmm. anything. Like she's an authoritarian mother, but it's not. She's just dressed like her. So I love having this kind of experience with you because I mean I've said like sometimes I'll like, usually I'll watch the movie along with the Wikipedia plot to make sure I'm like catching everything. Mm-hmm. I intentionally did not do that with this movie, and I only looked at the basic plot, like the one sentence log line. So I okay. literally had no idea where this movie was right. going. <laughs> yeah, and honestly, I would kind of advise people that that's the best way to do it because there's a bunch of moments in here where you just go, "Okay, movie, yeah. I didn't think you were gonna go there." Yeah, one hundred percent. Yeah, it, again, three star movie for me, but there's plenty of surprises in store. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Like, this is a hearty recommendation, even though I don't think it's entirely successful. Speaking of surprises, we're getting to our piece de resistance of the film. Oh, my God. It's so good. Yeah. So Megan doesn't approve of this outfit and she runs upstairs. And this is again where the mirror begins dripping blood. But Megan is actually here to see it. And this Mm -hmm. is when she seems to get a little sexually excited because she definitely begins licking and gently humping. Okay. So, yes. The licking at first, I was like, oh my god. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) We are licking this rando blood on this evil mirror. Yes. So that was my first jaw drop. Mm -hmm. Then she starts kissing the mirror. Yep. Second jaw drop. And then a a demon hand comes out between her thighs. Mm -hmm. Oh my god. (laughs) I don't even know. This is, I mean, I guess it's supposed to be her sexual awakening of sorts. So you were preparing it with like... Not puberty, because she's clearly already gone through puberty, but... But it kind of is, right? Like, I mean, this is an almost entirely female creative team with Mm -hmm. an almost entirely female cast. Mm -hmm. And we're dealing with issues of, like, sexual liberation, female rage, female oppression. This, to me, was very much a sexual coming-of-age moment where she is fucking this mirror. She's accepting this demon into her And as a result, she is kind of claiming her power, like her sexual agency via demonic possession. Well, and then the blood gets kind of more gushy. Really, it's the climax of this sex scene because we get more Mm -hmm. blood. I mean, I have never seen anything like this in a film before, and Mm -hmm. I am here for it. Oh, I'm so here for it. And just because I mentioned her off the top, I am going to reference a little bit from Kate Hagen's review. Mm -hmm. Uh, So she talks specifically about this scene. She says, the mirror is indicative of Megan's initial inability to embrace her personal style and the way she presents herself to the world. But once she's sexually communed with the incubus in the mirror, she's finally able to love her reflection in the endless void of mirror space. Most women struggle to love themselves from the beginning. And see, no, I 100% buy into that. Like, that is what's happening here. It just kind of after this, it's like, all right, well, now she's just going to be an evil person who just kills people. She becomes the serial killer of the film. Yes, yeah. She starts to get her revenge, but as a result, Megan, as we know her, is kind of just gone. And that's disappointing because the Megan that we were getting, like, I wanted to see that character find her strength. And instead, this just feels like, oh, okay, you know, we've got the actress here and she's going through the motions, but the character is gone. There is a moment later, a line of dialogue from Megan that we'll get later that honestly rubbed me the wrong not not because I think it's inappropriate, but because I just hated what it meant for this character. That it just it really rubbed me the wrong way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So uh <laughs> I guess the the sex scene is now done because she is interrupted by Emmeline. <laughs> Who finally shows up. <laughs> yeah, she's like, Hey, I'm here for my fucking mirror, and Megan's like, Bye, get out of here. I'm not I like the mirror, I'm keeping it. <laughs> yeah. 
Never seen so many people fighting about a mirror in my life. Emmeline's like, well, I, what comes to my shop? I have plenty of mirrors you can like. No, no, no. I like this one. <laughs> mm-hmm. Can you imagine somebody going to bat like, no, this is my mirror. I have yeah. to have this mirror. I will not part with this mirror. It's silly in concept. It's played pretty seriously here, which I mean. Oh, for sure. But like, it's, yeah, it's pretty funny to talk about. And interestingly enough, this we notice the change in Megan immediately because she's quite rude to Emmeline. She's slamming the door in this woman's face. And she's quote unquote prettified now. Oh, yes, yes. Um, in fact, let's get to that because we've got a cut to Charlene's party, which sidebar <laughs> appears to be taking place at the school. I don't think it's meant to be the school, but... That's it what I thought too. Though. Looks like it. <laughs> and this is when I realized that Nikki and Rom were dating because when they went into the closet to make out, I was like, oh, oh. I guess they're together. <laughs> Oh, that's funny. Okay. (laughs) Yeah, I do love that the introduction to this party is literally Charlene's what appears to be an actual presidential election campaign video. It is so ludicrous. I fucking loved it. Oh, I yes, I I mean, I don't think Charlene is really that memorable as a mean girl because she doesn't she doesn't really do much. Yeah, like she, she does a lot of shitty things, but there's nothing on par with what Chris Harkinson does, with mm-hmm. what Regina George does. Like, no. But I, I still think she's an interesting character. But yeah, this um this video <laughs> was like peak Charlene, and I loved it. Oh, it's so good. This was kind of queer icon status for Charlene, where you're just like, oh, I want to see more of this bad boss. She's so much. It reminds me of Elle Woods' Harvard Law video. <gasps> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Only really diluted. No, absolutely, for sure. But like, I want to be like, oh, I object. I am comfortable using legal jargon in everyday life. <laughs> <laughs> My tits will save this school. <laughs> that's, I mean, that's really what, yes, yeah, right. exactly. Okay, so Megan arrives and she, I mean, I don't want to say that she's looking hot because I actually always think that megan looked good it's just she's classically attractive now she's white as a ghost but yeah like she, that's what it's like i have it in quotes but yeah it's like she's sexified yeah exactly and she immediately catches jeff aka ted she catches his eye and he asks her to dance and it's actually kind of a nice moment where they connect and he wants to talk and she just says can we please just dance and she puts her head on his shoulder and mm-hmm. You're like, oh, this is sweet. It's reminiscent of the first scene between her and Nikki. Like, I mm-hmm. I like watching this. Yeah, to the point where I was pretty sure it was a setup, and it is revealed to be a setup. Mm-hmm. But it's believable enough that you think Jeff Ted may actually like her. Well, and he does empathize with her. Like, he constantly tells Charlene, like, why are you doing this? Like, what's your fixation on her? Mm-hmm. But he also doesn't do anything to stop any of it. So yeah. that that's the issue there. Yes, indeed. Yeah, so when Megan finds out, she runs off and she's tearful. And then uh, we see Charlene and Jeff Ted making out in the car and he is not into it. And as she goes to give him head, he's like, get the fuck out. And they break up. This is, again, well, Carrie comparison, but it's just like the scene in Carrie when Mm -hmm. Chris uh, gives Billy head to make him help her with the pig's blood thing. Which is always something I laugh at because she's going, Billy, 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 while she's giving him head. And Mm -hmm. it makes me laugh so hard. (laughs) You gotta, you know, multitask. Talk around that dick, ladies. Mm -hmm. (laughs) 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 Oh my god. This is where we get canceled. No, it's fine. Uh, We've given blowjobs before. This is unabashedly true. Yes. (laughs) So... Charlene and Jeff Ted are officially broken up and he immediately goes to Megan's and they begin making out. She's a bit too aggressive for him. He becomes confused. Like he doesn't even seem to understand what's happening. Because, hey, so I think it's implied that Megan's will, like the mirror made him come there. The mirror oh, for made sure. him want. To, yeah, exactly. A hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. It's just interesting to watch him try to grapple with it. Like, he both seems to know what's happening, but also not. So then, mm-hmm. of course, then he says, you know what? I think I need to leave. I need to figure out what the fuck is happening. She gets upset, and she more or less commands the mirror to first murder him and then get rid of the body. Um, question for you. Mm-hmm. How does he die? I don't know. He he gets touched 
by the mirror hands and it turns him bloody and then he <laughs> dies that's yes I, it, it's almost like it's bashing his head into the mirror but like yeah it's we just constantly it's edited really weird but we keep seeing the hands shake his head mm-hmm. which gets yeah progressively more and more bloody and mm-hmm. then yeah that's it I don't think we had a stunt coordinator or maybe the budget or the time to do something more than just cover the actor in blood. Well, and here, maybe it's a budget, a bigger budget, but like, why not take the, like the hands of the nails of this creature and just like push them into both sides of his head? Mm-hmm. You know, like, give me something. Give me a kill. This isn't a kill. This is just something that's bloody. Yeah. I'm thinking of some of the other scenes, and I'm wondering if they're saving the pyrotechnics, per se, for later deaths. It's possible, but I mean, the most makeup-heavy bit is the Charlene stuff. Uh, and Susan's hand. But see, though, we don't see the hand. We see, like, I mean, we see, like, a quick cut of her hand where it's covered in blood, but there's mm-hmm. no mangled, like, prop hand there. We, we do see a lot of blood spraying out of the sink, mm-hmm. but there's no, like, real prosthetics involved. Right. Okay. Uh, and we do get those with Charlene on her body, but yeah. it's a, a lot of it's masked by the steam. That's why it's steam. This is true. I mean, I, I think this is getting creative with what limited budget you have. Like, yeah. I will say Jeff Ted's death is the only one where i do have uncertainty like i don't really know what happened <laughs> yeah i'm just that's like correct. Oh, okay he's dead got it yeah <laughs> that's all it is yeah so this is the moment where susan tries to connect with megan because she heard screaming and <laughs> megan just turns her out and then susan goes back to bed and this is where we see that bill is in there with her and we also have megan talks to the mirror and goes make him go away and Mm -hmm. jeff ted's body just disappears it's amazing in the blink of an eye no yeah but we actually get to see it it's like oh we cut away and we go back and he's not there we see him fade away which is actually Mm kind of cool yeah i liked it Mm -hmm. (laughs) all right so at school the next day megan vows to help nikki even though charlene has already won the election so folks the election has been won it happened off screen That's cheating the audience. That's what that's called. I needed a Charlene victory boast scene. Oh my god, right? To like just really nail in how much of a cunt she is. Like just Mm -hmm, like give it. We're bleeding into her big death scene, which again, I actually think is a mistake. I don't think it should be happening here, but that's okay. Yeah, no, I agree. Uh, Okay, so (laughs) it's just every time in my notes, back at the house, Emmeline is doing (laughs) something. (laughs) No. Every time I have an Emmeline bullet in my notes, I bolded it to be like, okay, like let's separate these out. And this is this is like a short film that we have with Emmeline doing her own thing. A hundred percent. Yeah. It's like this this could be taken out. It could be its own standalone short. Just, you know, Emmeline does. Emmeline mm-hmm. reads. Emmeline goes to the house asking for a mirror. <laughs> Emmeline gets stabbed through the hand and then runs away and leaves the second dog to get killed. Oh. She like she hears that dog die and still books it. Like <laughs> uh-huh. she knows what's up. Yeah. So Emily, she walks in with the black cloth. She touches the mirror, which then pierces her hands. Mm-hmm. She drops the cloth and runs away. Yeah. She nearly did it. She just needed to not actually put her hands on the mirror. And that's where if we're going into like Oculus territory here, like I do think that movie does a better job of showing the mirror's influence on people. Mm-hmm. This one, I was very unclear. I was like, wait, what? Like, she looks a little hypnotized, but I'm still not clear what's happening here. Yeah, I think default, just assume people are being hypnotized. Yeah, they look at it, boom, done. Exactly. (laughs) You got one split second chance, and then you're in trouble. (laughs) Bitch should have walked in with a blindfold. (laughs) Walk in backwards using a (laughs) Medusa mirror. (laughs) Yes, yes. Oh, my God. (sighs) So back at school, and Trace, I have to tell you, as a person who has played water polo, I died watching this scene. This is not water polo. <laughs> okay, I didn't know what this... It, it's like beach volleyball. I mean, like water volleyball. No, this is supposed to be water polo. <laughs> I Honestly, I don't think I know what water polo is. <laughs> Picture soccer in the water. But, like, they're breaking every rule. You're not allowed to touch the ball with both hands. You're not allowed to put your feet on the bottom of the pool. You have to swim the whole time. <laughs> what? That sounds impossible. Uh, that's why it's a really, really hard sport. Okay. <laughs> no, because there's literally a close-up on these two girls' legs, and she's constantly, like, jumping on the thing. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, why, why are we just watching this girl, like, just jump a lot <laughs> from beneath the water? To the point where it almost feels like male titillation. Like, 
we know that this was written and directed by women, and yet there's so many underwater leg shots that I thought, who is the audience for this film? Well, and we're going into the one scene of nudity, which, okay, so, so yeah, let's, uh, Charlene and uh, Nikki get into a fight, Charlene gets into the shower, and Mm -hmm. everything starts steaming and she gets burned alive, but... yes. At first, I was like, okay, so we're not getting nudity. Because we have her undressing. We don't get the nudity there. Mm-hmm. We go to the shower. We get a butt shot. Okay. Mm-hmm. But then all of the shots of her breasts are, like, filmed a certain way to where we don't see the breasts. It's, like, side boob or just above the nipple. Like, we don't see it. And then when, like, the steam starts coming, that's mm-hmm. when we get full-on nipple shots. And I was yeah. like, that's weird. <laughs> like, <laughs> why did we save this? I mean, not that I wanted to see her boobs earlier, but I was like, well, if, you ha- if you're going to show them, why are you going out of your way to hide them in earlier shots? It's almost like a tease, isn't it? You know, oh, you're only going to get tits when you get the steam. Oh, maybe so. Maybe they told the actress, <laughs> the steam's going to hide it. Don't worry. <laughs> no, right. Ugh, that's uncomfortable. I'm sure that wasn't the case, but. No, but it's strangely tasteful, even though I do agree with you that I think you could have actually shot this without ever showing her tits. Yeah, I mean, it's a sh- It's reminiscent to me, too, of the gym teacher death in Nightmare on Elm Street 2. Mm. But... Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I think this is the most impressive death scene from a, an effect standpoint, too, because we at least do get the makeup of, like, her skin that's melting off. Yeah, it does look good. I found it goes on a little too long. too long. Yeah. I know what's happening, and I don't need the repeated cuts back to Megan in the pool, clearly not playing water polo anymore, and no one yeah, she's a focusing shit. on she's focusing on carrying the shower room. <laughs> exactly. Like, hey, Megan, oh, she just got beamed in the head. Oh, she didn't notice. Hmm. Weird. Yes. <laughs> uh, I will also say I fucking love the moment where they discover this horribly charred body of their mm-hmm. friend and schoolmate, and this gym teacher just goes, yes. everybody go get dressed. I wrote this too. I was like, this is the equivalent of the, hmm, black arts. Like, she's just yeah. like, there's, there's a corpse in this room. Um, gotta do something about it, I guess. <laughs> you know what? People just die in this town all the time. I can't be bothered by it. I've got another class to get to. It was to the point where I was like, maybe she didn't die. Maybe she's just going to be really injured. Well, okay. I thought that Tobo had died and then they wheel him out. So I was also maybe waiting to see, oh, okay. She's just been really badly burned. But no, she's dead. Yeah, she she is absolutely dead. <laughs> mm-hmm. Which is why Nikki then gets upset with Megan literally moments later when Megan's like, hey, so now you're the president. <laughs> yeah, aren't you happy? Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. <laughs> yeah, Nikki, Nikki doesn't care for that. This is when we start the kind of like best friends turning against each other. And mm-hmm. this is when Megan really is like out of the movie for me because, okay, so we get this line. So she's in the bathroom together and, you know, Kim's hiding in the stall, but we have Megan confront Nikki, and then she basically uses her powers to, like, cause her abdominal pain. Mm -hmm. And she's like, look, see, I can control it. I can stop it. But, like, she's hurting her friend. It's so mean. And then she goes, or I can start it. Yeah. And that, that one line where it's like, okay, so now you're going to fucking hurt your friend to keep her your friend. Mm Mm-hmm. That was when it went, like, because, okay, and we're going with Carrie. Carrie at least stays sympathetic. Yeah, she's a total mass murderer, but, like, she's kind of, like, gone through a fugue state, blah, 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 but she's right. still a sympathetic character. Yeah. This, to me, is when Megan stops being sympathetic. Uh, agreed. And I do think a big part of this is that no one bullies Megan ever again. Like, mm-hmm. we just see her acting out against, yes, the people who have bullied her before, but also people that she has no relationship with. So she immediately goes from, has these burgeoning powers, oh, she's misusing them. You know, she lashes out at Charlene, which is totally understandable. But then from here on out, it's like, oh, okay, you're just cold-blooded now. Well, and again, the whole thing is supposed to be, okay, well, the mirror is, um, you know, controlling her now, the demon of the mirror. But unfortunately mm-hmm. for me, what I'm getting is, oh, okay, this is another scenario of a victim using their victimness to excuse really shitty behavior. Yeah, and uh, I can't remember, what episode was it where you you talked about that in depth? I feel like it was one of the Patreon episodes, right? Oh, I have no idea. (laughs) I have no clue what you're talking about. (laughs) 
<laughs> well, there goes that Patreon. Plug. I know. Where can we plug that? Uh, y'all, you know what? Go subscribe to the Patreon and listen to everything and let us know where that is. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but you, you are on the record as having said you don't like it when people's victimhood gets used as an excuse for turning them into villains. I mean, it could be argued that her even killing the bully girl is an example of that because yeah like you no, know i i mean it would have been nice to have seen a little bit more malice from charlene but at the same time there's something satisfying about watching megan get that particular piece of revenge no no no. i do i do get that but again it's like okay well yeah she's a bully but does she need to get murdered for it you know right which I, i'd argue well we're watching a horror movie so yes it does mm-hmm. um oh you don't but... just want her to like lose a couple strips of hair a la christine taylor yeah yeah right that's not enough <laughs> <laughs> my hair Oh my god, right? Oh my god, maybe the craft did see, they they did see this movie and that's why they did the pool stuff in that movie. Oh, honestly, folks who like the craft, I want to know, have you seen this movie? Do you also like this movie because they feel like companion pieces? I like this more than the craft. Oh, actually, is it the craft we were talking about? <laughs> no, no, that, that wasn't it. But I, although I do hate <laughs> what happens to those girls. True. Yeah. Anyway, so sorry, yeah. Uh so she Nikki storms out. mm mm-hmm. Mhm. Okay, so this was a piece where the film actually did surprise me because I definitely thought that we were going to get Kim rising to be new head bitch because she's hearing (laughs) Megan confess and you think, oh, she's going to use this. She's going to turn everybody against Megan. It's going to be bad. Megan just fucking rips out her tongue and she is dead on the floor of this bathroom. We don't see it. We see the aftermath, but... I was going to say, I wrote, I was like, okay, well, she's dead. I think she slit her throat, but I did love the way that she... she it, Basically, Nikki runs out, and Megan just goes, Kim, and, like, kicks mm-hmm. open the stall door. <laughs> Maybe she was there all along. We need to have a chat. <laughs> she's fucking scary at this point. Yeah, I mean, it, it's good. I mean, it's just like, yeah, I, whatever, but... Mm-hmm. Now we're really in the Nikki movie. That, that That's what the rest of this movie is. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So Nikki grabs Ron's car. She goes looking for answers. She eventually winds up connecting with Emmelyn. And this is where we figure out, okay, we need to stop this mirror. It's not really Megan anymore. So... so- Okay, I want just clarification really quick, though. So, mm-hmm. Emmeline tells her that... So, in the beginning, the opening twin sister scene. Right. Elizabeth is the one who got killed. And so she goes, Elizabeth called forth the demon and the mirror controlled her. So her sister Mary killed her to appease mm-hmm. the mirror. So so the one who was doing the murdering wasn't the one under the mirror's power in the Correct. beginning of the movie. She was like okay. the Nikki. Yeah. Oh, yeah, right. Because as we'll find out soon, <laughs> that's what happens. Mm-hmm. Mm. Yeah, so Emmelyn says, okay, here's this dagger that <laughs> the Weatherworth sisters used that I apparently just have in my antique shop. And yep. she says, I'll meet you, but I got to <laughs> do something first. So she goes to call the priest, and this is where astral projection <laughs> starts to come into play. Megan apparently has the power to shatter a mirror in Emmeline's room, and she dies when the shattered glass impales her. So what would make sense here is if it's like Snow White, like the mirror in, in Megan's room shows her mm. what the mirror in Emmeline's room is seeing. Like, again, it's a portal to other worlds. It's a portal to other mirrors. That would make sense. Like the mirror, the demon in the mirror can, sen- can see whatever, whatever any mirror is seeing. So he's like, hey, look, this bitch is trying to stop you. That would make sense. The right. way we have it, though, it's just like she just knows. Mm-hmm. She just knows everything that's happening at every point. Yeah. Also, in this hypothetical scenario, is Megan now being played by Julia Roberts? Yes. <laughs> oh my god, we haven't made a mirror mirror joke yet. Everyone, we're, in case you haven't <laughs> learned, we are not talking about Tarsum Singh's Mirror Mirror with Julia Roberts. <laughs> oh my god, can you imagine if people have gotten, what, fully an hour and like 10 minutes into this episode, and they're just going, where is Julia Roberts in this description? <laughs> Or if they're watching the mirror, the mirror, mirror with Julia Roberts, and they're like, "Where's the horror?" Oh God! I'm actually because I just rewatched that um, Snow White: A Tale of Terror with Sigourney Weaver recently, mm-hmm. and I-, I was getting a lot of callbacks to that as well. Yes, I did see a bunch of people making sort of Snow White references with this, which I think again mm-hmm. is part of course when you have Talk a about mirror. mirrors. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> We're starved for mirror horror content, folks. We need more mirror horror. Honestly, I'm I'm here for it. I would also be here for it. Yeah, give me any fun and object and like make it evil. Like just do it. I don't care. For sure. Yeah, give me Oculus too. Is what we're saying. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. All right. So Emmeline is now dead. Goodbye. Her three days of filming. Goodbye, Yvonne De Carlo. Mm-hmm. You were missed. 
Yep, that's a that's a wrap on you, Ron DiCarlo. Thanks for coming by. <laughs> and so we cut to Ron enthusiastically making a mayo mayo sandwich. This scene <laughs> it goes on for so long. Here? They they knew what they were doing because we then get the cut to the sandwich, which looks like absolute horseshit. Oh, it looks like gar- Well, it looks like a teenage boy made it, so it's messy and all over the place. It- yeah. It's just ingredients splayed out that he, mm-hmm. like, he didn't compile the sandwich. He just put the ingredients out and said, that's a sandwich. <laughs> Do you think he was just going to put it on the counter and then, like, climb onto the counter and eat his way across and then <laughs> call it a sandwich? <laughs> I thought you were going to say climb on the counter and shit on it. <laughs> uh, no, I was not headed in that direction. <laughs> Wait, are you thinking of other reflective surfaces and what people do with them? I guess. I don't know. <laughs> Wait, what are you trying to reference? What are you making a joke about? Uh, you know, uh, shitting on glass countertops and stuff. <clears throat> do people do that? It's a kink. Oh, okay. I mean, no, I'm not going to keep You shit. lie under the glass coffee table and then people shit so that you can see the poop hit the glass. Oh, Okay. Not gonna lie, I mean, I knew I know that scat play is a thing. Um, did not know the glass thing. That's actually kind of interesting. I mean, not that I want to do it, but <laughs> it's actually kind of interesting. Like, oh, okay, like, it's like a barrier. Like you're safe from the poop. You just get to see it. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. And uh, I don't know how to come back from that now. Yeah, I'm just. <laughs> um, okay, so so Ron, Ron is uh, making Nick- a sandwich. Yes. N- N- Nikki's in his bathroom drowning. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So. I know that we don't love this back half of the movie as much. I fucking love this part, though. I, okay. I'm hoping you're going to say the same. No, you're going to say I, no. I, oh, shit. I, no, I, I, I don't dislike it. I'm just kind of like... What? Um. Well, I like it fine. I like it fine. So I, I thought it was bad editing. I, was like, okay, I guess Nikki made her way there, and like the mirror somehow uh, got her in the tub and drowned her. Like I, I wasn't aware we were in a doppelganger situation yet. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, it's because it's a power we've never seen before, so it doesn't make sense initially until you see Nikki come through the front door and you realize, wait, why do we have two Nikki's all of a sudden? Well, I did realize it before that because she starts aggressively kissing him in the water yes. <laughs> before Nikki walks in. And he's a teenage boy, so he's a fucking idiot, and he just goes along with it. I, I'm watching this, and I'm thinking, Ron, she is actively drowning you, and you think you're going to get laid. Yeah. So if you have not seen this movie, listeners, he walks into the bathroom, Nikki's body is in there, he thinks that she's drowning, and he mm-hmm. pulls her out, he gives her mouth to mouth, she coughs once, and <laughs> no water comes out. <laughs> no. And she's like, I'm okay, really? And then she like kisses him as a thank you, but then she pushes him back in the tub and starts making out with him. Like really aggressively, though. Yeah, really aggressively, and then starts pushing his head underwater and mm-hmm. kissing him underwater. And while that's happening, that's when we see Nikki, like the real Nikki. And then we're like, oh, mm-hmm. this is an evil mirror do- mirror doppelganger going on up yeah. here. <laughs> yeah, and then she bites off his lip and mm-hmm. then drowns him. And then she kind of hides in the corner as real Nikki comes in, sees his drowned bloody body. And then she turns around and sees herself cowering in the corner and then laughing and then she disappears i did like that i thought that was actually really really creepy <laughs> like I, again if we're talking video store fodder here like, i can see a child renting this and like this is terrifying oh my god this is kinder trauma for sure yeah, yeah. i mean a child would be shocked by the mirror fucking scene too but uh, maybe um, yeah <laughs> but yeah <laughs> Uh, I do also love that Nikki immediately knows what's up because she walks out of the bathroom, turns, sees the phone, calls Megan, and Megan just like, hey, you're my best friend. Why don't you come over? Okay. I do love this line from Megan, though, where she's like, so the phone call is basically over, and, and Megan goes, oh, and Nikki, that silly old woman from the antique store, <laughs> she won't be joining us. <laughs> I did like that. <laughs> We've already said she's out of the movie. That is a wrap on her. <laughs> Uh, okay so it is important to note that susan has been in this movie a couple of times we sort of uh alighted over a couple of her appearances but she has acknowledged that she hasn't been a great mom to megan i love that the movie does this i love that we get this moment which i mean granted it's only so we can feel bad for her when she dies but very true it it works though like the scene when she because i i don't know if she's still with sheriff dearborn or whatever but like Mm. she basically says hey let's have a dinner with just us like i really want to i want to start mending this relationship and Mm -hmm. it's like good for you karen black yeah for sure 
it, it's a really nice, genuine moment. So it has come time now for Megan to join Susan at this fancy, nice dinner for just the two of them. And Megan basically shits on that idea. So Susan goes downstairs and she tosses the nice meal into the garburator. And Megan has a change of heart, but it's too late because the mm-hmm. mirror locks her in her room. And they're so connected that Megan immediately knows what's happening. And she knows that this fucking mirror is going to kill kill her mother using the garburator what i love though so we get a fake out which is a trope with a garburator that happens in way too many movies mm-hmm. and i was like okay I, well, for, I was relieved because i will say that a garburator scene is a really cheap way to like get you on your on the edge of your seat because oh, it works sure. like yeah it works but it, i've seen it so many times and i'm like okay i don't need to see it again because I, i'm nervous the entire time watching it but like and that's the point but like it's old hat now mm-hmm I love that this movie gives us a fake out. Yeah. And then, like, she pulls the thing out, and it's like, oh, all is good. Mm-hmm. But then she drops something else in there. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you thought she was safe? No. We're going back for seconds. Ugh. Uh, and it's, it's, I mean, it's blood just spraying out of this garburator. Like, yeah. Like, it is, is a lot. We get it in slow-mo, so it's extra goopy. And mm-hmm. I think it's also important to note that the mirror is doing something interesting at this point, too. So we have black liquid that's spraying out of it, and it actually shatters. And going back to Kate Hagen's reading of this, she reads that as Megan trying to fight back against the mirror and feeling really bad about the fact that she didn't want to kill her mom the mirror did so the black liquid is like her trying to fight back so that so i wrote blood here but it is black but i just assumed it was just bad fake blood (laughs) oh okay (laughs) i wrote those oh this is the shining like this is the elevator in the shining Mm -hmm. yeah because it's a lot of blood Oh yeah, it's a great shot. Again, we kind of we're kind of angled, we're down, angled up towards the mirror as we're seeing this, and it's really really cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah, honestly, everything to do with the mirror is shot really well. The mirror is a figure of menace, and it doesn't do fucking anything. It's great. Yeah. So then. Yeah, Nikki comes in, and you know, mm-hmm. we have our windy climax. Yeah, so she tries to break the mirror. That does not work. And then she tries to take Megan out of the house, but they cannot open any of the doors. Yeah, we basically got a hurricane-level winds going through this house. I did write, though, when Nikki's trying to climb up the stairs, because, you know, it's just, like, fans blowing on him. Mm-hmm. I was like, good for this actress. It really looks like it's hard for her to climb up this staircase. <laughs> oh, yeah. You can just tell Sargenti's, like... Point the fan directly at her. Blow her down. Kristen Dottillo, please look like you're climbing really up a steep hill and just grab onto the banister. Just grab onto it. Mm -hmm. She's holding on for dear life. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, so at this point, they've been separated, which is why Nikki goes back upstairs. And when she comes into the room, (laughs) Trace, she discovers that Megan has died by suicide. Yeah, okay, so I didn't get that. I I thought that maybe the mirror killed her. I don't know, but that makes more sense. Because she kills herself to appease the mirror, right? Well, to to stop the possession, because the mirror needs someone who has made a wish to possess. So by Mm -hmm. killing herself, she has basically done what the sisters did at the beginning. She has ended the possession, so the mirror no longer has power. Right. Um, would you also have the mirror doing some um, Evil Dead too, like, or Evil Dead join us, but it's just going, Megan, mm-hmm. Megan. <laughs> oh yeah, this mirror's been talking to people the whole time. We just haven't yeah. been referencing it. <laughs> it's very vocal. So yeah, that is, that's a thing that happens. Mm-hmm. But then Nikki just looks at the mirror <laughs> and goes, revert everything back to the way it was. And I was like, okay, we're doing one of those. Like, that's... Yeah, did you think that we were just going to walk it all back? Yes, that is exactly what I thought. The movie has way more confusing things in mind for us, though. Oh my god, yes. So what happens is we transport Nikki and Megan back into the Weatherworth sisters from the opening scene of the film. At this point, Megan is already dead, so it's like post-stabbing from the opening scene. But yeah, basically... Nikki starts to freak out, and this is when the demon in the mirror begins to creep out. I don't know what this is. So yeah, it, its face comes out. It's a long. It goes bit. on for a while. Yeah, <laughs> where it's just roaring and roaring and roaring, and Nikki's looking at it, and it sticks its head out, mm-hmm. roars some more. Yeah, it and then goes back in the mirror. What do you want? You want more? Like okay, so. 
What? I, I know what happens to the demon. Like, it sticks his head out, says hi, goes back in, whatever. Yeah. What is, like, what happens? What is this? <laughs> I have so many questions. Wikipedia says that she's stuck in an apparent time loop. And I'm like, but... <sighs> So I literally had to go back. I was like, okay, wait. So were these two actresses the same ones in the beginning? Are we seeing that time loop? No, 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 no. Mm -mm. They are played by different actresses. Mm -hmm. So the mirror grants her wish by making them the Weatherford sisters. Sorry, Weatherworth sisters somehow. Yes. But then when it gets to the present day, who's going to be Megan and Nikki? Well, I think what you're meant to assume is that that won't ever happen because... Now that Nikki is in the past, she will make sure that the mirror doesn't possess anybody because that's why she covers it up, right? So the film ends with her saying, okay, I'm going to control this power. Sure, my whole fucking life is now ruined. Everyone that I have loved is dead. I am trapped in the past. Yeah, I'm trapped in the past. That really sucks. (laughs) But apparently, yay, the evil is contained. I mean, I watched this and I was like, what? Like, Mm -hmm. what? What? Oh, it is baffling. It is audacious. It makes no fucking sense. And I kind of applaud the movie for taking this big fucking swing. It is audacious. I will give you that. I mean, this is going to be more conventional. I would have preferred just like, okay, Nikki gets up to Megan. The demon comes out. They have to fight the demon. Right. But that's conventional, right? Like, that's yes. not... It's and also, satisfying. we don't have the budget for that. And that may honestly be what, what it is. Like, I can almost guarantee you that was the original ending of this movie. And they were like, oh, we're out of money. (laughs) Look, we gave you one dad who's got a melty face. And then we've got just enough budget left over to give you burnt tits and whatever this thing that crawls out is. Yeah. That's all. And wind. Lots of fans. And lots of fans. Yeah. The fans come cheap. Um, Yeah. I mean, yeah, I, I, I don't like this ending because I don't even think that they know what it is. It definitely feels like, okay, what's something that we can do that we can afford that we have the time, rather, to shoot? And I don't think it's satisfying, but it is memorable. No, you are correct in that. Absolutely correct. But yeah, I think I was kind of like, still like, oh, do I want to give it a three or a three and a half? And this was like, no, it's three. It was a (laughs) three. Fuck you, three. (laughs) I have issues with this movie. I do think the first half is a lot stronger than the second half. Yes. But... I still like it. Mm-hmm. And I would, yeah, as we both said twice, it's a, it's a hearty recommend. Like, if y'all haven't seen this movie, check it out. It's, um, it's a strange one. Yeah. We didn't really know what to expect going into this, and it could have been a raging dumpster fire. And I've come out of it with some kind of admiration. It makes me wish that a lot of the people who worked on this film had had better careers so that we could see what else they were doing. Because I think this film is such a well shot. I think it's well acted. Yeah. I would have liked to see what they could do with a bigger budget and more special effects. But overall, I'm happy to have watched this. I agree with what you're saying about the directing, the acting, the shooting. I do think the score is a little not good. Ooh, you'll die. I saw someone reference that it's kind of like a Christopher Young Hellraiser. And I just thought, um, see, no. I was getting more, I was getting more Charles Band, like Puppet Master. <laughs> That's what I was getting from this. <laughs> right. Yes. One of these actresses, I think it might be the woman who plays Charlene actually is from one of the Puppet Master films. Uh, it is. She's in Puppet Master 2. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I mean, I only bring that up because we just, you and me, for shits and giggles, just rewatched Ginger Dead Man, and mm-hmm. it was giving me those kind of vibes. <laughs> oh, you mean the score? The score, Okay, yeah. I was like, oh no, this is a much better film. <laughs> no, 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 I, I, yes, 100%. Ginger Dead Man is a 60-minute movie that feels like five hours long. <laughs> uh, but but the score, it, it's that Charles Band. Like, yeah. the, it just, it's, it's not good. <laughs> and so that's what this reminded me of. <laughs> Maybe they got someone on Retainer. Yeah, Moonlight Pictures or whatever. Um, But yeah, listeners, let us know what you thought of this. I mean, I wager for most of you it's probably going to be a first-time watch, but I'm also curious to know about the people that grew up with this. Mm -hmm. Obviously, Joe and I did not, but if this was a cable mainstay for you or a video store regular rental for you, I'm really curious to hear those stories. So please, like, share them with us. Yes, especially if you happen to be at a younger age and maybe watch this at, like, a slumber party or something like that. I would love to know how this goes down. Mm, 100%. But yeah, so I think that'll uh, kind of close out Mirror Mirror for us. Uh, I, yeah, I like, I, we don't often walk into these with no idea what to expect, Joe. So uh, this was kind of a fun one to visit together. For sure. 
Uh, but before we announce what we're covering next week, um, we'll go through some standard housekeeping. So, if you'd like to get in touch with us, you can reach us on Twitter and Instagram at Horror Queers. Join our Facebook Horror Queers group to hang out with other listeners and occasionally interact with us. <laughs> Just occasionally. We're not on there very often. I mean, I'll reply to things that I feel compelled to reply to, which um, sometimes it's a lot. <laughs> it depends on my mood. Right. Um, you can also find us on Letterboxd to keep track of all the films we've covered. We've got lists for our main feed films, Patreon films, audio commentaries, micro queers. Uh, just basically, we want to make a checklist for all of our episodes. And finally, we've got a YouTube channel, so go check that out to watch some of our uh, videotaped, videotaped micro queers episodes. Oh my god, we're like direct to video. Yes, exactly. If you have a moment, please rate and review us on your podcatcher of choice. We, at least in the States, we have almost 400 reviews on Apple Podcasts. We need about 12 more. So if 12 of you want to go write us a review on Apple Podcasts, preferably five stars, we'd really appreciate it. Ah, wouldn't that be sweet? It would be great. And if you want even more Horror Queers content, please support the show by becoming a patron at patreon.com slash horrorqueers. Uh, so this month we've got a Ghosts and Zombies theme. We'll have episodes on new film Seance and Army of the Dead with episodes, I, I guess I'm going to call them um, classic episodes. No. <laughs> Complimentary. Oh, yeah. Complimentary oh, classics. And complimentary episodes for those films on Ouija Origin of Evil and Zack Snyder's Dawn of the Dead remake. So, yeah, I think it's going to be, I mean, I think it's be what we're doing it right now. It's really fun. Yeah. <laughs> Subscribe and listen. <laughs> Joe. Yes. What are we checking out next week? Okay. So, we went a little bit obscure this week. So, we're going to go a little bit more popular, but we are going to stay in the 90s, Trace. <gasps> My favorite. I feel like I want to stick it with this high school motif, but I think I'm worried about aliens. So let's talk about the faculty. Ooh, first R-rated movie I ever saw in my life. Oh. Uh, so yes, I love this movie. I did just rewatch it recently, and I'm actually excited to watch it again. So <laughs> Cool. Yeah, I have very fond memories of this film. I'm interested to cover it because i feel like we're also the last podcast on earth to cover it like i've seen every other podcast mm. i listen to do it so we'll see if we have anything left to talk about uh you know it was filmed in austin oh was it oh that makes sense because Robert of... Rodriguez. yeah there we go um but yeah well i'm excited to check out the faculty with you and our listeners but until then we can cross out mirror mirror indeed yes and cross out horror queers <laughs> You've made it to the end of another bloody disgusting podcast. Congratulations. Hello, I'm Shelby Scott, the host of Scare You to Sleep, a podcast where I tell you spooky bedtime stories full of creepy sound effects and music that is soothing yet unsettling to help immerse you into a world of horror. This is a show for those of us who have realized horror can be a strange but relaxing escape from reality. Speaking of escapes, sometimes I lead you through guided nightmares, like a guided meditation, but instead of flowery meadows, I take you on a journey through your own personal nightmare. So come get lost in the terror with me. Listen to Scare You to Sleep wherever you listen to podcasts or find us online at bloody.fm. Sweet screams.